Pixar's Academy Award-nominated, Golden Globe-winning 2006 film Cars is an entertaining kids movie that produced two garbage-tier spin-offs, a horrible first sequel, and a surprisingly good second sequel. On its surface level, it's about Lightning McQueen, a big-shot rookie racing driver whose drive to win leaves him stranded in a small town off the derelict Route 66, where he learns to manage his hubris through being forced to make acquaintance with the simplicity of a quaint rural community and its people. If you look at it a bit more deeply though, the film takes on a slightly different light through which it transforms into a tale about a staunch capitalist learning to love and support his fellow man, er, car, through immersion in an anarchist commune. Before I go into that, I should probably explain what anarchism is. Contrary to the popular perception of anarchism, anarchists aren't agents of chaos seeking to destroy everything good about the world. Anarchism is actually a genuine political ideology that's existed since at least 1790. As said by TV's Thought Slime, To put it simply, an anarchist is someone who doesn't believe that anyone should have power over anyone else for any reason unless it absolutely cannot be avoided. All authority is considered illegitimate by default and must prove itself to be both necessary and beneficial, or be dismantled and replaced with a more egalitarian system. If you don't think that's a thing that can actually happen, you probably had the same pro-capitalist education that I did and never learned about revolutionary Catalonia or the Zapatistas, both of which were highly functional anarchist societies. Revolutionary Catalonia only ended because Hitler and Mussolini gave their fascist buddy Franco some money to stamp them out, and the Zapatistas are technically still around, hanging out in the Chiapas Mountains, making coffee and, you know, not having oppressive hierarchical structures. If you still don't think anarchism is a thing that can work, check out Non-Compete's How Anarchism Works series here on YouTube. So, in short, under anarchism, hierarchy is bad, political and economic coercion is bad, property and industry are run collectively, everyone contributes what they can and receives what they need, and communes are generally made up of small, mostly self-sustaining communities. Got it? Good. Okay, back to cars. Cars starts out with Lightning McQueen, a racing driver, can you really call them drivers if they're piloting their own bodies, who is making, presumably, millions of dollars per year. One of his opponents, Chick Hicks, is plastered with the decals of what is a relatively absurd number of sponsors, one of which is, no joke, Hostile Takeover Bank. Despite having all these sponsors, Hicks wants to win the Piston Cup so that he can take the place of the King Strip Weathers as the driver for Dynaco, which would net him even more money than he's already getting from his ludicrous amount of sponsors. In order to make it easier for himself to win the race, he intentionally gambles with the lives of tens of other cars by causing what would, if this wasn't a Pixar movie, be a massive pileup with multiple fatalities. He even makes his capital-centered intentions explicitly clear for us, saying, Dynaco's all mine! immediately before endangering his competitors' lives. Let's move on to McQueen, though, because he's pretty much the epitome of smug, hot-headed, asshole capitalist. After this opening race, McQueen's entire pit crew, which just so happened to be making a fraction of what he is, quit because of how terribly McQueen treats them. Seriously, he constantly downplays their contributions to his success, calls himself a one-man show to reporters, and is rude as hell to their faces. Not to mention the fact that he just fired his pit chief because he wanted to be that one-man show that he talks about all the time. He has no respect for his team, and that's really a thing that you need to have in motorsport. He's also openly derisive and ageist towards his sponsors at Rusty's, despite the fact that they're giving him millions of dollars and treat him unbelievably well. Like, I get it, dude. You've got a literal advertisement for what is essentially hemorrhoid cream emblazoned on your face, but you're getting paid millions a year for that decal, so the least you can do is be nice to the people who put it there. Following that begrudging meeting with his benefactors, McQueen decides to literally work his driver into unconsciousness. Mac is the only employee of McQueen's that hasn't been either fired or bullied into quitting, and he forces the guy to carry him on his back until he passes out from exhaustion. The entire reason he does that? Dynaco. He wanted to get to the Piston Cup racetrack first so that the Dynaco bigwigs would see him practicing and take a liking to him. Just like Chick Hicks, McQueen is so enamored with the idea of having even more money than the millions he already has that he works his employees to the absolute bone. As you probably already know, Mac falls asleep, which causes lightning to roll out of the truck, and he then subsequently drives off of the interstate and onto Route 66 to look for his truck. And now, finally, we've reached Radiator Springs.
The first member of the commune that we meet is the sheriff. Admittedly, that seems like a bit of a hard sell right off the bat for this whole anarchism thing, but hear me out, okay? Inherent to any community is a need to be able to respond to emergencies, and anarchist communes are no different. As explained by Nongampete in episode 3 of his How Anarchism Works series, emergency response crews in anarchist societies would be volunteer positions that are directly accountable to their community, similarly to volunteer firemen or paramedics. The reason that I believe this is what's going on in Radiator Springs is literally written on the guy. He's a sheriff meaning he was elected, and is therefore accountable to the people of Radiator Springs. I know that sheriffs in the real world generally aren't held accountable, but that's mainly due to insular sub-communities of police unions and other officers protecting their own, and considering there are literally zero other cops in Radiator Springs, as well as the fact that the sheriff is very clearly integrated into the town, getting along with and regularly spending time with them, I think it's safe to say that he'd be held accountable by the rest of the commune. So, the sheriff tries to pull McQueen over for speeding through town since it's super dangerous to drive at racing speeds through a commercial area. In trying to avoid the sheriff, McQueen ends up basically destroying their entire main road, after which he's apprehended and taken to court. Here, we get one anarchist theme, and also one very not-anarchist theme. For the former, the town overrules Doc Hudson's decision to just kick McQueen out of the town, arguing that the community should decide together with a vote instead of one person being judge, jury, and executioner. For the latter, they decide to sentence McQueen to manual labor, which is kind of very not anarchist. There's a slight bit of redemption in the fact that he only stays in jail for one night and is put up in a hotel for the rest of his sentence, but the fact of the matter is that he's doing what is clearly difficult physical labor, which is very not cool. Like I said though, this movie is almost an anarchist masterpiece. It's got some shortcomings. One thing that is definitely not one of those shortcomings though is the community dynamics of Radiator Springs. The place basically functions as a moneyless society where everyone just gets what they need. Like, they definitely have businesses, but there is quite literally no point in the entire movie where money exchanges hands, er, tires, between residents of the commune. They talk about money at points, but it's never in relation to each other. In fact, literally all of the money-based conversations are centered around their crumbling infrastructure. See, 15 years prior to the events of the film, a car called Big Al moved out of Radiator Springs, and he just so happened to be the only car there with the horsepower to maintain their roads. As such, the main strip of the town wasn't doing great even before McQueen destroyed it. On top of that, they've got the issue of Route 66 itself falling into disrepair. A small anarchist society that's existing within a larger capitalist country, in this case Radiator Springs existing within the United States, is going to need to outsource some things, and doing so will inherently require capital, as they are trading with capitalists. This isn't really a problem in unions of communes, as at that point, you've pretty much got intra-commune access to everything you'd need, whenever you need it, since businesses and anarchist societies are inherently non-competitive, seeking only to provide for the customer rather than to earn the most money. Here though, after Big Al's departure, they don't have any way to repair their roads themselves, and, due to the fact that literally the only road into their community has been allowed to fall into disrepair by the federal government, no one visits Radiator Springs anymore, and thus they have no influx of capital from tourists with which they could pay for people within the capitalist system to come and fix their infrastructure. Looking at Radiator Springs' economy through this lens, the sequence round about the middle of the film where everyone reminisces about the good old days, back when the town was bustling with life, comes across as a much more wholesome and genuine memory of when the commune was not only self-sustaining, but also more populated. Radiator Springs is a ghost town. The movie definitely recognizes that and frequently frames the town as such, with establishing shots juxtaposing the small, crumbling main strip against the desolate Mojave Desert. If you're an anarchist, living in a literal commune, in the middle of the largest capitalist nation on earth, chances are that you've got strong political convictions. If that community that you've worked for decades to keep running, that you've dedicated your life to, started leashing residents as people moved or passed away, you'd be pretty sad about it, wouldn't you? I really like this reading of the Remember How Good Radiator Springs Used To Be sequence, because the alternative, non-anarchist reading is everyone just going, man, weren't the 70s great? A remembrance of days gone by which is not only thoroughly exhausted as a narrative in its own right, but one that feels especially out of place now, given the current political climate which is rife with folks using that same nostalgia for the past to surreptitiously push agendas far more insidious than just missing your old neighbors. Speaking of pernicious subtext, the Cars series has a lot of rather dark implications. I'm not going to go full on Jack Saint here, but it's definitely worth touching on. 
So, in this universe, people aren't humans, they're cars. If a person wants to change their career, they can just go to college, or trade school, or do an apprenticeship, or just, you know, start a small business and try their luck in the free market. Cars, though? I mean, if Clayton Gentlebreeze here wants to become a pit stop forklift car like Guido, he's gonna have to change his chassis, his engine, his bodywork, his tires, just about every single thing about his physical form is gonna have to change in order for him to achieve his goals, and there isn't really any existing infrastructure in this universe to facilitate this change, even for multi-millionaires like McQueen. That is, unless you count the stuff used to make Mater into a super spy in the second movie, but that's made out to be an extremely high-tech governmental equipment thing that isn't really available for the general public, and they sort of address it in Cars 3, what with McQueen being unable to race competitively anymore due to not having a good enough engine, but it's only barely part of the storyline. The best way that this issue is addressed in the series is in Cars 1 with Doc Hudson. Doc used to be the fabulous Hudson Hornet, basically the Juan Manuel Fangio of the Cars universe, a famous racer from the 50s era with countless records and more wins than anyone else of his day. Sadly though, Doc was injured in a racing accident. He was able to recover, but when he went back to race again, things didn't turn out as planned. When I finally got put together, I went back expecting a big welcome. You know what they said? Your history moved right on to the next book he's standing in line. There was a lot left in me. I never got a chance to show. Cars paints a painfully realistic picture of the capitalist world that we live in. Many people simply have no other option than to just stick with the career they've chosen, since starting a business or going back to school costs more money than most people can reasonably afford. This issue is worsened by a multitude of factors. Race, class, gender identity, able-bodiedness, or a myriad of other things or combinations of those can make getting that starting capital much harder, not to mention greatly hampering one's upward mobility. Through Doc Hudson, Cars sort of presents a solution to this problem. What Doc ended up doing was pretty much disappearing off the face of the planet by moving to Radiator Springs, where he ended up becoming the mayor, the town judge, and the resident doctor. While he obviously wanted to continue his racing career, he instead chose not to stay in the capitalist world that had pretty much just thrown him to the curb once he stopped being useful, electing instead to join a commune and do whatever his heart desired. Sally's backstory is quite similar, but she's an example of someone who chose to turn her back on capitalism rather than being forced out of it. How does a Porsche wind up in a place like this? Well, it's really pretty simple. I was an attorney in LA, living life in the fast lane. Well, that was my life, and you know what? It never felt happy. So I left California, just drove and drove, and finally broke down right here. <laughs> Doc fixed me up, Flo took me in. Well, they all did. And I never left. She feels yeah. uncomfortable with her life as a capitalist, ditches it, gets injured in a commune, is brought back to health and cared for by everyone there, and decides that she really doesn't like capitalism after all, and joins the commune herself. Speaking of joining a commune, that's basically what McQueen ends up doing. Like, he finishes his sentence and then just hangs around town. Even after the race, he moves back to Radiator Springs. This bit where he's just spending a day in town features the scene that really seals the deal for me on this secretly being an anarchist film, though. He gets a set of non-racing vanity tires and a paint job that covers up all of his sponsors, and he visibly loves it. He quite literally covers up all of his branding, stops being a commodified billboard for corporations, and is actually expressing who he is as a person. He's no longer Lightning McQueen, racing driver for Rusty's The Bumper Cream. He's just Lightning McQueen. The symbolism is honestly a bit on the nose here. Like the second that he stops being a racer and is just himself, he starts having a really good time. Plus, this new self-expression is quite literally reflecting Radiator Springs. He stopped being a capitalist and just became part of the commune. And when that very same world of capitalism finally does find him, it's really upsetting for him. They pretty much force him to leave, and he really doesn't want to go. One of the main tenets of anarchism is that it's inherently non-coercive. If you want to live in the commune, you can, but you're not going to be stuck there due to a lease agreement, or stuck in a dead-end job due to the threat of homelessness, or anything like that. Capitalism, though, thrives on coercion. There's a reason that employees show up sick to food service or health jobs so often, and it's not that they want to get people sick, but rather that their boss is coercively threatening them with unemployment if they don't show up to work no matter what health they're in. 
So McQueen leaves the commune and heads to California for the final race of the Piston Cup. But when he's trying to race, he can't stop thinking about Radiator Springs. He's once again knee-deep in his job where he gets paid millions of dollars, and he can't help but reminisce about just being back at the commune. And then the whole anarchism interpretation just about completely falls apart. There's still a few bits that stay in line with it, like McQueen forgoing winning the race and the million bucks in prize money in order to help the king cross the finish line in his last outing before retirement. But overall, though, the film takes a nosedive back into capitalism and its denouement. Doc resurfaces as the fabulous Hudson Hornet, going back into the racing business as McQueen's pit chief, which completely undoes the interpretation of him joining the commune for a better life after capitalism forsook him. McQueen gets a horrible amalgamation of that expressive paint job from earlier and his Rusty's branding, effectively destroying any and all symbolism that it had. And he does move back to Radiator Springs, but he sets up his racing headquarters there, essentially turning the small town into a capitalist business hub. Sally even acknowledges that it's going to pretty much destroy the dynamic that they had going before lightning came along. There's some rumor floating around that some hotshot piston cup race car is setting up his big racing headquarters here. Really? Oh, well, there goes the town. Finally, there's the fourth to last line of the movie, which completely ruins the entire concept of Radiator Springs being a moneyless anarchist commune. Last one to flows buys? I mean, it might work with mutualism instead of anarchism, but hey, I did say the movie is almost an anarchist masterpiece. Yeah. Good job! Thank you for watching my very silly video about cars. I'd like to give a huge thanks to Luna Abbott, American Johnson, and Jonas MacArthur for their help with the script. Please like the video if you liked it, subscribe if you want to see more videos from me, and leave a comment below letting me know what you thought. Also, if you want to support me making videos, I've got a Patreon where you can get early access to them as well as see scripts and behind the scenes stuff. I've also got a GoFundMe set up to help me pay for the medical bills associated with having a genetic connective tissue disorder, so if you could donate to that or signal boost it or this video, that'd mean the world to me. Anyways, that's all I've got. Have a nice day, and sit up straight in your chair. It's better for your back.